got a new camera, eh? I remember being there, not knowing what to do. But lucky for you, I'm gonna teach you the basics of how to use your camera today. Now you're asking yourself, why should you trust some random dude on the internet? Uh, honestly, you really shouldn't trust anybody on the internet, but I've used a camera a couple times before, so I'm gonna teach you through my personal experience. And what do you have to lose? Stick around, maybe you'll learn a thing or two. So let's get started. Cameras come in many different shapes and sizes. Some are big, some are small. Some have fixed lenses, and some have unlimited lenses. Some are uniquely simple, and some are simply unique. Despite their differences, they all have one thing in common, that if you don't know how to use them, your shots will look like this. You think that looks good? It's literal trash. So let me break it down for you. These are the fundamentals of what you need to know in order to use your camera like a pro. Before we begin, we have to do one thing that's gonna change your life forever. That's right, we're shooting in manual mode. An important thing to know for manual is that if you're taking photos, you shoot in M, but if you're taking video, you shoot in movie mode. We'll get back to video once we cover the fundamentals, so for now we're starting in M, manual mode. I know it can be a little intimidating, but in order to fully understand your camera, you need to be in full control, and you get a pass to the cool kids club if you shoot in manual, so just saying. So today's lesson is going to go over white balance, aperture, shutter speed, ISO, and frame rates. Starting with white balance. So your camera's white balance basically controls the tone of the color in your image. It does so by measuring on the Kelvin scale, which is this diagram here, which goes from 1000 Kelvin to 10,000 Kelvin, going from warmer to cooler tones. If you see my walls are white right now, the white is balanced. In the world, there's so many different light sources and each of them work on a different color temperature. Daylight is around 5600 Kelvin, whereas your everyday light bulb is around 3200 Kelvin. Sunrises and sunset, that's about like... I don't know, maybe like 2000. The most important takeaway is white balance basically sets a neutral tone to where there's no color cast. This is gonna be on the more extreme side, but let's bump up our white balance to a higher Kelvin temperature, which is gonna make it cooler. Now you can see everything is too blue. I look like I'm underwater. If we lower our color temperature, it'll be too warm. Now everything is kind of yellow. This is called a color cast, and that is what we're trying to avoid by setting proper white balance. Sometimes with color cast, you get some magenta or green hues. So usually in your editing software, there's a slider to fix that as well. To be honest, I literally just keep my white balance in auto. I know auto, whatever, but modern cameras are pretty good at setting white balance. And unless you have a constant light that you can count on, it's gonna be a hassle to constantly be changing that. All right, so that's white balance. On to the next, which is aperture. So what aperture is, is it's the amount of light that your lens allows your camera sensor to see. I have this funky old TV lens here to demonstrate. Every lens comes with something called an f-stop. This lens goes from f1.9 to f16, and that varies depending on what lenses you have, but each lens has something called aperture blades. The way it works is when you adjust the aperture in your lens, the aperture blades will come closer together or more open together. A lower number in f-stop will allow more light onto your sensor, which will overall brighten your image and also give you a shallow depth of field. On the contrary, if we increase our aperture to a higher number, it closes those aperture blades tighter, which allows less light into your image, making your image darker, and it also increases our plane of focus. Let me explain. So I just set up a scene to show how the plane of focus changes when you change your aperture. I'm using a 50 mil lens that goes down to f1.2. So at f1.2, the plane of focus is very shallow. As you can see, my birthday cake is in focus, but Oscar in the back is super out of focus, and the Rubik's Cube in the foreground is also out of focus. If we shift focus to the Rubik's Cube, now the background is very blown out, but the Rubik's Cube is now in focus, and that works for Oscar too. We can get Oscar in focus, but now the foreground and the midground are also out of focus. As we increase our f-stop, our plane of focus also increases and more is allowed to be in focus. If we increase our f-stop to something like 5.6, we can see that more is in focus now. There's less of a shallow depth of field. Oscar is still out of focus and the Rubik's Cube is still out of focus, but at f16, now pretty much everything is in focus. Your depth of field is also determined by your lens. We're shooting on a 50 mil, so there's a little bit of compression, but if you shoot on a wider lens, more would be in focus. You guys doing good? That's aperture, let's get to shutter speed. So shutter speed is basically how fast your shutter is opening and closing and allowing light to get to your sensor. Things to note with shutter speed is it also determines your motion blur in your image. A shutter speed of one over 50 is determined to be the most natural looking motion blur that our eyes see. So if I wave this wand around, this is close to what it would look like in real life. If you look at a freeze frame, you'll see that there is the stick, but there's also motion blur that follows with that. If you want to freeze motion, you'll shoot at a higher shutter speed, like one over a thousand, 
That'll ensure that there's less motion blur depending on how fast a subject is moving. A lot of sports photography will shoot at higher shutter speeds to capture fast moving subjects. If you wave this wand again, you'll see that there's no motion blur and the stick is essentially frozen in time. This also works on the further end where you get a lot of motion blur if you're waving this around now. A slower shutter in photography is generally used for astrophotography or light paintings, light trails. Shutter speed is a little different when you get to video, so we'll talk about that later when we talk about frame rates, but just a general rule of thumb is something called the 180 degree rule. Your shutter speed for video should be one over your frame rate times two. That's just like a general rule of thumb to ensure that your video has natural motion blur. You can also shoot at a higher shutter speed in video to have something called a staccato effect, which makes it kind of like jaggedy. And this is used in like fight scenes to make it look like crazy, I guess. And on the contrary, a slow shutter will make it kind of be warpy. And this is used for like drunk scenes or a dreamy effect. That's basically shutter speed. We're almost there. ISO is basically your sensor's sensitivity to light. And it's almost, people call it like fake light, basically. So if you look at this test frame, our exposure is at zero, our aperture is at f1.4, shutter speed one over 50, and our ISO is at 100. Let's just say the lights turn off. Now our exposure meter is reading negative 1.3. The image is underexposed. Our aperture is still at f1.4, our shutter speed is one over 50, and our ISO is 100. Let's say our lens only goes to 1.4, so we can't stop that down any further to get more light into the image. So then we look to shutter speed and ISO. Let's say I wanna keep a one over 50 shutter speed. So after all is said and done, now we can look to ISO to increase our sensor's light sensitivity and kind of bring back more brightness into the image. As we increase our ISO, you can see our image is back to being properly exposed. However, the higher ISO you go, the more noise that is introduced. So you wanna keep your ISO generally as low as possible. And most of the time, it's the last thing that I touch in the exposure triangle. So now that we're talking about video, we actually have to switch to movie mode. This is better set up for shooting videos while the manual mode is more for photography. So the way video is measured is frames per second. The simplest way to understand it is that when you take a picture in photography, you're capturing one frame and basically video is a compilation of those frames that are fit into a one second interval. When you play those frames back, it results in a moving image, which is then video. The new thing that you need to learn here is called frame rates. Generally, movies are shot in 24 frames per second. So there's 24 images, 24 frames that are fit into that one second. TV is shot at 30 frames per second. And after that, it goes into the slow motion territory at 60 frames, 120 frames, and it goes I guess the ceiling's unlimited. The reason you shoot at higher frame rates is that there's more images, more data to allow you to slow it down. If we tried to slow down a clip that we shot at 24 frames per second, there's not enough images to compensate for the extra frames since we're extending it past that one second. So then your video becomes choppy. That's why we shoot at higher frame rates like 60 and 120 because once we extend past that one second mark, there's now extra frames that can be allocated to those missing frames that we're basically making up now. Lastly, a simple formula that you can follow to slowing down your slow-mo footage is 24 or whatever real time you're shooting in. If you're shooting in 30, you could just replace 30 here, divided by the amount of FPS that you're shooting in. The result of this formula gives you the percentage that you can slow down your high frame rate footage in in post to ensure that your slow motion footage is smooth. And that's it. The goal of this video is to have you leaving knowing the basics of how to use a camera and if you're a little confused still, don't you worry. I've asked the best teacher in all the five boroughs to come help us out today. So, straight from the L chain, can we give a warm welcome to Dora the New Yorker? Thank you, thank you. Hola, soy Dora the New Yorker. And today's mission is to make sure you're leaving here knowing the basics of how to use your camera. I got my boy Boots over here to make sure you're paying attention. Ain't that right, Boots? Come on, vamanos. Come on, Vominos. Hey, everybody, let's go. Boots. Hey, I know that we can do it. Dang, Boots, you're looking tough right now. Let me get a picture of you. Nice. Can you take a picture of Boots? All right, so for this shot, we have Boots. This is just a uh, recorder so you guys can see my screen. So we have our subject here, and our shutter speed is 1 3rd of a second, F13, and our ISO is at 80. Exposure looks pretty good right now. The only problem is that shutter speed 1 over 3, if we take a picture, the shutter speed's too slow to hold the handheld, so all the little micro jitters that I do ends up showing up in the image. So to fix that, let's crank up the shutter speed. Let's go to 1 over 125. 
Now the image is too dark. I think for this photo, we'd go for a shallow depth of field. So let's go all the way down to the fastest, which is 2.8 that this lens can go to. And we're still a little underexposed. So now lastly, after we dial in our shutter speed and aperture, we can bump up the ISO. And now Boots is looking fuego. All right, say cheese. See that back? Boom. Great shot, guys. Come on, let's get to it. I know that we can do it. No mama's way, look at that view. Wow, look at this view. Do you think you could help me take a picture of the view? Dang, Yankee with no rim leg does not work. All right, so we got our composition. We have Little Island in the foreground and the World Trade Center in the background. We're shooting at f2.8, one over 800, and ISO 100. For a scene like this or landscape in general, we'd want the background in focus all the way to infinity and the foreground in focus. So what can we do to get everything in focus? That's right. We'll go to F16. You can go higher if you can. But now our image is darker. So to fix that, what can we do? That's right. We can drop down our shutter speed. I wouldn't go below 1 over 60 for handheld shooting because any movement will cause motion blur. So let's go maybe to 1 over 125. Now we're still underexposed. So lastly, we could touch our ISO and we'll bump this up until we have a properly exposed image. That looks pretty good to me, so boom. Look at that photo. Great job, guys. Vamanos. Boots! So annoying. Dora. Oh, yeah, <laughs> what do you think? Dora the New Yorker. Hey, look at the, look at the, where, where's the brim? Where's the brim? No brim. No brim. No brim. Let's go. Uh oh. That sounds like mm, splitting. This thing is just buzzing. Swiper! Swiper! What? Boots! You're too slow, man! Swiper! <laughs> He's too fast. I have an idea. Can you guys film this in 120 slow mo? Remember what I said about the 180 degree shutter rule. You ready, Boots? We did it! Great slow mo shot, guys! We did it! We did it! We did it! Oh man! Well, that's the basics of how to use a camera. Thanks for watching, and if you ever get confused, just watch this video again. Adios! Yeah.